that continuing our uh, Knowing God series. This is part five. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. This is part five of the twelve. This is uh, we're talking about the omniscience of God. So the last time we were on this series, because the last time we were here, we did a communion. So I, I dedicated that message to the understanding of the communion. And so this time, I mean, last the time before that, we did the omnipotence of God. His, him being all powerful, him being almighty. Now we are dealing with the omniscience of God, him being all knowing, all wise, and all understanding. So uh, today our main text will come from Psalm chapter 139. Who in here would like to serve a God who only knew as much as we did? Anybody? There ain't no God. Doesn't seem like a God to me. The God who is limited by our knowledge, our understanding, our thought process, our mentality, our culture, our generation, our world. Who wants to serve that God? The God that doesn't understand any more than we do. So then when we have questions, that God has questions also. When we have our wondering about the future, that God also wonders about the future because he's not omniscient, he doesn't know everything, so there's no way he can see the future. <laughs> Some try to paint a picture of God where he knows all things, so then he responds to what he knows. That's not the God that the Bible speaks of. So then that is a God of their own imagination. Because the God that the Bible speaks of is a God who plans out all things from the beginning, doing all things by the counsel of his own will, meaning he does exactly what he wants to do, Amen. how he wants to do it, and whether we understand it or whether we perceive it as good or bad, all things, even the evil things, at the end, in the ultimate finality of all things, will be for his glory. Because he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's all-wise. He's all-understanding. And we are finite beings trying to understand the infinite knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. So when we look at this text, Psalm 139, I don't know if anybody can explain it, at least in human words, any better than David did. All right, so start with verse one. We're going to read verse one through six, and then I'm going to tie it into some other things so we can understand the word of God more clearly. O oh Lord, you have searched me and what? Known me. Yes, Lord. You know my sitting down and my rising up. Jesus. You understand my thought afar of off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of what? My ways. God knows all of this. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For there is not a word on my tongue, not oh. one single word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You know every single one of them. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Now, this is verse 6. Such knowledge is what? Too 
wonderful for me. It is hot. I cannot attain it. I cannot attain it. I cannot attain it. We cannot attain it. God knows all things. He knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about every single being that has ever been created. Hallelujah. No thought, no word, no language, no deed goes without God's total, complete understanding. Whatever is done has been decreed from eternity past. Whatever will come to pass has already been declared from eternity past. God has already set the plan. We just live in it. Because he knows all things. I want this to happen. It will go this way. Or because of these things, the outcome will be this. When Adam ate from the tree, mind you, God had already elected those he would save before there was even a tree in the garden. The Bible says that before all creation, before the foundation of the world, so therefore in the foundation of the world, there had to have been the garden. So then therefore, before the foundation of the world, uh, God had already elected those he would save. He had already uh, uh, set the cross in front of Jesus that he would die for before he created the world. So then before there was a garden of Eden for there uh, to be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And before there was an Adam and Eve to eat off of the tree, God had already chosen how everything was going to go. And so then we wonder and we ask the question, well, why evil? Why did you create Satan? Why this? Why that? The answer is, God did everything by the counsel of his own will. He did what he wanted to do. He didn't react to what happened. He created everything. All things, the angels included, which Satan was the angel Lucifer, all things were created by God. And nothing, not one single thing, not the rebellion of Lucifer. Nothing caught God off guard. Amen. Nothing. Because if it did, then there must be some lie in this Bible that says that God knows all things. How can he know all things if something caught him by surprise? So then, nothing catches him by surprise. He doesn't respond. I don't need a God that responds to something happening. I need a God that plans everything. And even though I may not understand his plan, I understand that ultimately all things, it didn't say some things are just the good things, but it said all things work out together what? For the good. For who? Those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So no matter what the devil may do, no matter what life may bring, no matter what struggles I may face, because he's the omniscient, he's the all-wise, he's the all-knowing God, I can trust that whatever he has planned for me will be for what? My good. Amen. Now, what do we think about death? Is death good? No, death is our enemy. Right? Doesn't the Bible say that when the final enemy is under Jesus' feet. Amen. So if the final enemy is under Jesus' feet, and the final enemy is what? Death. death. Then death is not a friend to us. Amen. However, however, looking at the big picture, does death not bring about eternal life? Yes. So then even in the physical death, for the believer, not for everybody else. For everybody else, they won't wish they lived their best life. Amen. Because this will be their best life. If they don't believe in Jesus, if you deny Jesus, if you die without Jesus Christ truly in your heart, this will have been your best life. You better make it a good one. Because the next life, the next, the eternity, you will spend suffering. <laughs> So then the all-wise, all-knowing, all-understanding God 
from eternity past, before he even created the Garden of Eden, for there to be a fall. He already had his son prepared to sacrifice his life yes, he for us. Yes, he, he called us friends before we were even mm -hmm. beings. Yes, uh, uh, one scripture says, before I was formed in the womb, you already knew me. It says that God can number the hairs on our yes. head. He knows yes. everything. Yes. Now, it wouldn't be that hard to number the hairs on his head.
with my thoughts. He's well acquainted with why we made the decisions and why we did this and why we did that and, and why so many divorces and why so many bad mistakes and why you did this wrong and why you did that wrong. God knows you. So then as Sister Davey was, was, was testifying Come on. that can't nobody and Sister T the same way and Brother Adam the same way and like I said, God knew how to set up this sermon that Nobody can praise God. Nobody can worship for me. Nobody can tell me what is inside of me because I know what God did for me. Yes. Praise God. I know what God is doing for me. Yes. Yes. And God knows how he's working in me. So then if Sister T shout, let her shout. Yes. Yes. And if somebody else got a song, let her sing. Yes. Now, I may not be a singer. So then, Lord, I want to offer you my worship. He said, Make a joy of the Lord, Lord, I'm gonna make a joy of the Lord, but I'm not, I probably try to do it this way because I want my joy of the Lord to be joyful. joyful. <laughs> I can be joyful when I'm doing this, but I'm not a singer, so if we all singing together, okay, cool, but let me preach and let me shut up. But God is acquainted with our ways, He knows I can't sing. He knows I love them drums, but I don't love them drums more than I love this. And so then I can sit here and enjoy someone else who plays the drums much better than me with not one ounce of jealousy or nothing because he gave me my own lane. But he knew what lane to give me because he knows. Sometimes I don't even know why he gave this to me, but he knows. For there is not a word on my tongue, not nothing I said to y'all surprised God. Jesus. Not nothing that was said today in this building surprised God. Matter of fact, Amen. just the way it went from Sister Tyre to Brother Alvin to Amen. Sister Dan to, to Mother Fred to uh, uh, whoever else testified to myself to this message. It was all planned out in order oh, by yes. God to yes. go the way it went. Yes. Everybody talked about God knowing everything. And how God knows you and how God knows you as an individual and how he knows us as, as, as corporately and how God knows all things. And then here's the message about the omniscient God because he knows everything and he worked it out according to the counsel of his own will. And I'm asking y'all, y'all keep hearing me say that, and that's what the Bible says, but do y'all understand what that means? What does it mean that he works things toward in the counsel of his own will? What does that mean? He does what? He what he wants to do. Yes. And as we went over last time when we were talking about Job, he does not owe us what? Any, Any explanation. He don't got to tell you why he did this. Yes. He doesn't have to tell you why he did that. He said he gave us one job. And what job is that? Trust him. him. Amen. Thank you. Lord. That's it. Trust and what? Obey. Obey. He didn't ask us to figure it out. He says, I figured it out. Yes. You just follow my lead. There is not a word on my tongue except you know it all together. You know every single thing that's going to come out of my mouth, good and bad, whispering and out loud. You've heard every single word and you know them before they even formed in my mind. Go down to verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Such knowledge, the knowledge that God has, is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain to it. I can't even grasp what God knows. So even if he did tell me why he created Satan, and even if he did, or why he created Lucifer, even if he did tell me why he did these things, I wouldn't even be able to get it. The Bible is clear that the foolishness of God is what? Wiser than men. Amen. And that's an actual scripture. I didn't make that up. No, that's true. Did, am I right or wrong? No, you're the right. The foolishness of God, e even if God told us that he did something that was foolish, we would not understand it. Amen. Because the wisest human being, which would have been what Solomon, didn't, didn't even have a, 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 a fraction of what God understands. He didn't even have a fraction with all his great wisdom. He still fell to the, the, the desires of the flesh. So then obviously he had no understanding of the wisdom, the, the vastness of the wisdom of God. Y'all just 
understand that? Oh, yeah. We are trying to understand. We're trying to read the Bible. We're trying to study the Word of God with the limited knowledge of our pea brains. Come on. How can we possibly understand a fraction of what God has to give us? So then, therefore, we understand the scripture well when he says that we should pray, ask God for the wisdom, ask God for the knowledge, ask God for the understanding to which he gives liberally to those who ask for it. Why would we need to ask a God for understanding, wisdom, and knowledge who doesn't understand any of who only reacts to the situations we get ourselves in? He didn't know we was going to get an accident up the road. He's just reacting to the fact that we got an accident. I don't need that God. No. That is no God. I can react to what happened. We, we, we react to what happens. But God orders what happens. Amen. Before the devil could touch Job, who did he have to go to? God. And God either said, yeah. Or nay. The devil means to destroy us, but God uses that same evil that the devil would put against us for our good. Thank you, Jesus told Peter, I told y'all this before. Jesus told Peter, he said, Satan desires to what? Sit you like wheat. Come on. He said, But what? I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Why would Jesus tell Peter what Satan desired if he didn't already know? Amen. He already knew. Amen. He knew that Satan was going to try to destroy the saints. He said, listen to what he said. Listen to the implication of his words. He said, Satan desires to sit you as weak, but, but I have already put my plan in motion. I have already, I know what Satan is doing. I have already put the plan in motion that your faith will not fail. This is the same Peter who went out and denied Jesus three times. Amen. And Jesus still called him what? Friend. friend. Amen. My friend denied me to my face. Yes. However, to the same friend he says, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, the very forces of evil, the face of Satan will not prevail against the church. You might yes. kill the body, but you will not kill the soul. Because, because Jesus rose again, yes, so is. will I. Yes, so Lord. So yeah. Death, death, where is your sting? You've lost it. Why? Because I'm not afraid to die anymore. I ain't rushing to the casket. But when he decides, when in his plan, he decides for me to go, I'm ready to go. Jesus. Y'all understand that? Because I know that Jesus went to prepare a place for me. Jesus. Yes, Lord. You, that where he is, that we who believe in him will be also. Jesus. Because, and why did he go to prepare a place for us? Because he knew we were going to need somewhere to stay. Come on. Because this world is what? Not our own. Jesus. Yes, Hallelujah. What one of the to tell us? We're just like, um, Thank you. Pilgrims or something, we were just tra just travelers mm -hmm. passing through. This ain't our home. Not so. But God knew that. Amen. So, uh, sticking with the omniscience of God, look at Revelation chapter 1. All right, look at verse 10. This is, this is John talking. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So when is the Lord's day? Sunday. Sunday. Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, these are the words of Jesus. Amen. What you see, write in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Listen to this. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, 
one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So, what he's describing is what we read in Hebrews chapter 4, that we have such a high priest. Jesus was wearing, what John saw was a vision of Jesus wearing his high priestly garment. So when, when John saw this, he seen the exalted Christ. Jesus was three things for us. Priest, or prophet, king, priest. Priest, prophet, king. However uh, order you want to go. He was a prophet, obviously. He was, he was our high priest. Yeah. He mediates between God and man. Yes. Right? Yeah. And then he's our king. So yeah. all of those three things are simple. Then look at... Uh, Verse 14. So then this is, listen, listen to what I'm saying. Now a lot of people have taken this verse, this scripture out of context. When we talk about the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, this is what John is describing. Uh, I've heard it for years and years and years. I heard this since I was a kid. Where this verse is made out to be something about the color of his skin. This has absolutely nothing to do with the color of his skin. Nothing at all. This is talking about the glory and the majesticness of Jesus, what John saw. So he says, his head and his hair were white, like wool. Wow. White, like wool. So that white hair was talking about that white, like wool. It says white, like. And then it says, as white as snow. White, this hair on his head. It didn't say it was wool. It said it is like wool, the color of wool, because the crown of the head, his head, was talking about his omniscience, his supreme wisdom, the all-knowing, all-understanding, all-wise God. These things are symbolism. These are not, what, what, what John was seeing was not physical aspects. He was seeing, again, mind you, it says, Verse 10, it says he was in the what? In the spirit. What he was seeing was a spiritual symbolism. Yes. yes. It wasn't a physical thing. And we'll see that as we go because, again, it says like wool, as white as snow. So it was talking about the wisdom, the all-knowing, the all-knowingness of Jesus Christ. Then it says, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Wow. No, it doesn't mean that his eyes were red. It means what we've just been talking about, that he's able to see through your very soul, that wow. everything is laid bare naked in front of him. There is nothing that you can hide from him. Wow. He knows your thoughts. He knows your, your innermost being. He know you while you were formed in, before you were formed in the womb. He knew you before the beginning of time. He created you. He already chose you to be saved. He knew you before there was a you. So then when he says his eyes are like a flame of fire, he sees through you. Wow. And so does the word, so does the word of God. That's why the Bible says that we have to rightly divide the word. We can't cut it up anyway. We can't use it anyway. We can't say it anyway because he says we have to rightly divide the word of truth. That way we will not be ashamed when we present the word because we know we are presenting it genuinely and honestly and truthfully. But that's what it said. We just read in Hebrews 4 that it cuts coming and going. It divides between the soul and the soul. And, 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 and the, uh, uh, the, the physical, he knows us inside and out. Yeah. What John saw here was the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent Jesus Christ getting ready to pass his judgment on seven churches. 